Hello, everyone. I want to, you know, in the late 19th century, Edwin Abbott wrote a story about flatland. This is a land where inhabitants are lines and polygons that live in two dimensional space. Now, the protagonist is A square, and he you know, gets a chance to actually get out and visit Spaceland, which is the three dimensional world. And he's shocked, like, oh, wow, there's a 3D world out here, you know. He then returns to Flatland, tries to tell his friends, you know, there's a 3D world. And, you know, they, I think they kill him, you know. It really ends up bad for his square. In some sense, what I want to tell you today is the reverse story. Scientists have been working and studying three-dimensional materials for centuries. And about a decade ago, we realized that there's a whole world of two-dimensional materials that exist with materials with extraordinary properties and that we're just beginning to investigate now. So let me introduce you to some of these materials. The most famous is graphene. It's a single atom thick sheet of graphite, a honeycomb of carbon atoms, but there are plenty more materials. For example, hexagonal boron nitride. It's also a honeycomb of boron and nitrogen atoms. It's an insulator, that's why it's transparent. You also have a large family of materials called transition metal dichalcogenides. This is one example, tungsten diselenide. In this case, one monolayer is three atoms thick. Now, each of these materials have very unique properties, very different from their 3D counterparts. For example, in graphene, you can do tabletop relativistic physics, as I'll tell you in a moment. Hexagonal boron nitride is the thinnest insulator or tunnel barrier that you can imagine, less than one nanometer. And these semiconductors, their electronic properties change dramatically when you change the number of layers. For example, one layer emits in the visible, two layers emits in the infrared, etc. But what we've realized is that not only that, but we can actually assemble these materials into what are known as van der Waals heterostructures. We just put them on top of each other arbitrarily, one layer at a time, and we can make materials which you know, were impossible to think of before and with extraordinary new properties. But not only that, we can actually rotate these layers with respect to each other, rotate the relative crystalline structure of these two layers, and make millions and millions of possible combinations of new materials with unique electronic and optical properties which depend on this angle of rotation. So, let me tell you now an example of something that we've been doing in my group, you know. What happens if you put two of these materials, graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, on top of each other? Now, these two materials have slightly different lattices, and they are rotated with respect to each other. So what happens is that a moiré pattern forms, and it's a moiré pattern is a periodic structure whose wavelength depends on the relative angle of rotation between these two structures. Now, let me stop this before you get dizzy, you know. And, We've been investigating two extremes of this, of, of sort of this you know, twist angle rotation you know, paradigm. One is, if you have a very large angle of rotation between the two structures, then the Moray wavelength is about a nanometer, and then this hexagonal boron nitride is just a superb substrate for graphene, where graphene can exhibit its most pristine electronic properties. And those are actually governed by ultra relativistic physics. Moreover, in my group, we have discovered that if you apply a magnetic field to this graphene, you can modify the electronic structure and make it a topological material, a material which could have very unusual properties which could be useful for topological quantum computation one day. You can go to the other extreme. Now you can go and have the graphene and the hexagonal boron nitride almost completely aligned, almost zero rotation with respect to each other. Then you have this more wavelength of the order of 10 nanometers, and then the insulating properties of the graphene sort of leaked into the, 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 of the hexagonal boron nitride leak into the graphene, and then your electrons become massive. They acquire a band gap, and your energy level spectrum is, becomes fractal. And it's one of the first fractals that has appeared in physics, predicted 40 years ago, theoretically, but only recently discovered. Now, what is the deal with these ultra relativistic properties? Let me tell you how, how different are really electrons which are ultra relativistic from elect normal electrons. So let's take, first let's start with classical particles. Let's take Newton. Let's put a wall in front of him. And let's throw tennis balls at the wall, okay? As you see, they always bounce. There's no tunneling. You can take quantum electrons. Let's take Schrodinger here. Let's take a wall. Let's throw tennis ball, not the cat, to the wall. And, you know, most of them bounce. And every now and then, one of them makes it through in a process called quantum tunneling. You take quantum relativistic tennis balls. Let's take Einstein, let's put a wall. You throw balls, and they always make it through with 100% transmission probability. That means that ultra-relativistic electrons can go through obstacles. There's no obstacles for them. And that means that electrons in graphene, they have this linear energy-momentum relation, which is ultra-relativistic. For, for them, an obstacle, they just 
can sort of get converted into a hole and then into an electron and then into a hole and do, 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 do. they just go through obstacles and that explains why electrons in graphene have the most extraordinary mobility and they are the best conductors of any material. Now, will these 2D materials revolutionize technology? You know, we don't know. For the moment, you know, some of these materials, you know, graphene doesn't have a band gap, but some of these other materials like tungsten selenide, they have a band gap. Engineers know what to do with them. You know, they're more, you know, not ultra relativistic, they're more normal, you know. And in my group, collaboration with engineers, what we've done, for example, is we've made the thinnest diodes in the world. The diode is a, you know, one of the simplest electronic devices. You can put two gates and you can you know, make a PN junction or an MP junction. And once you have a diode, you can make solar cells, you can make photodetectors, you can make LEDs. So here you have, for example, a picture of the world's thinnest LED. It's less than one nanometer in thickness and it's shining right at you. Yeah? So this is something that you can do. Now, Will there be a nanotechnology revolution based on flatland? So people imagine that these materials, graphene and some of these other semiconductor materials, and we literally have now hundreds and hundreds of combinations of them, would one day could provide you with flexible, semi-transparent, large area, cheap electronics that will be incorporated into your fabric, that you will cover windows, you know, buildings, entire buildings with them, and power everything. Will this be true? Could be. But for my group, our motivation is actually entirely driven by curiosity. So we, we almost feel like we're playing with magic, you know, missing all these cards and making a heterostructure and looking at the properties. And, you know, that's what motivates us. And, and I agree perfectly with the quote from Bunny Babush that appeared a moment ago, you know, basic science really is, 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 is the key to this. Now, what's the future of MIT? Well, I double click there. People ask me always, for me, it's clearly, it's the people, it's the undergrads, the grad students, and the postdocs, and here are some of them that have contributed to this research, and I want to thank you for your attention.